cowbell was here. I thought if I see anybody going to sleep, I didn't know. Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll be reading verses 19 through 22. 1 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Word of God says, Do not quench the Spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, and it has been good to gather in your house today. We thank you for your mercies and goodness to us through Christ. Thank you for the time of prayer, and singing, and fellowship. And now as we come to the portion of the service in which we look to your word, open our hearts to receive it. Open our hearts to understand the truth that you have for us and change us that we may be like unto Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the songs were really good today. It was all about uh, all about spreading the gospel. And we do need to understand that obligation is us. We live in a lost world, and, and we see in more and more today the losses of our world. And there are many people that have no hope. And we have hope, and you have an opportunity to tell of the Savior who saves. Jesus saves, as we say. Well, we come to this passage today, and we think about personal responsibility. Personal responsibility, you know, it, it's something that we would all say is very important, but I think we could sometimes say it's a lost art today. Uh, we see... Uh, more and more people saying that, well, they're not responsible for what they do. They're a victim or something, anybody did something to them, and that's why they are the way they are. And a lot of people excuse their behavior, but the Bible calls for personal responsibility. We as parents have better be teaching our children from a very young age personal responsibility because we need to understand that there is a, there are consequences to that which we do. But more and more, we see even adults seeking, seeking to evade the responsibility for their actions. But if there's one thing the Bible teaches, it is personal responsibility. We uh, will all give an account before God, the Word of God says. We all have the responsibility to believe God's Word. We all have the responsibility to recognize that we are sinners and there is a, the only hope for our salvation is Jesus Christ. And actually, our eternal destiny, our eternal life, or eternal punishment depends upon how we respond to God's Word. But even as Christians, even those of us who know Christ, there is personal responsibility. We are saved by grace. We're saved by a work of God in our life. We were sinners. We weren't seeking God. God saw us, and that is the wonder and the beauty of the grace of salvation. Once He has saved us, he has now puts us into this program of sanctification. The, uh, the thing of making us mature in Christ. Of make, uh, in Christ. Making us holy. And that is a work that he does. But it is also a work for which we have personal responsibility in. There are plenty of commands in the scripture to Christians. And this book of 1 Thessalonians has a lot of them. Saying, do this and don't do this. This is part of the call for us to be responsible and exercise personal responsibility for our own holiness. It is the work of God in our life, but it is also that which we must bear responsibility for. So when we come to these commands that Paul gave, three commands here. It is really about us taking personal responsibility for our spiritual life when you think about it. Now, when we think of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is given to every believer. If you are a believer in Christ, if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. And he works in many ways in our lives. You cannot live without the Holy Spirit working in your life. He teaches us. He leads us into all truth. He comforts us in difficulty. He guides us. He directs us. Every working of God in our life is in and through the Holy Spirit. 
And so when we look at these passages, he's going to tell us about the personal responsibility we have for our spiritual life as God is working in us. The first thing he says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. That passage, verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Quench means to put out a fire. And what does he mean by that? Well, obviously, if he's talking about the Spirit, he is talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, he is not saying that by some reason, some ability of ours or something that we do or do not do, that we can diminish the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit, there, there are three in heaven. There's one God, but three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all have, each have the attributes of God. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is God. So there is nothing that a human being can do to diminish the power of God. So that's not what Paul's talking about. So what does he mean when he says, do not quench the Spirit? Well, he is talking about us in some way diminishing the work of the Spirit in our lives. Now, he uses this when he says do not quench. It has to do with a term you would use for fire. And in the scriptures, you see, well, God himself is compared to fire. The Holy Spirit is compared to fire. In, in the, the, the scriptures... Fire cleansed, fire destroyed, and we see both things with God in the scripture. We see where God purified and cleansed, and when we see that through fire he destroyed. Sodom and Gomorrah were burned by a judgment of God. And so the Holy Spirit is even closely associated with fire on the day of Pentecost. When the Spirit was given to the church as a, as a continual dwelling within believers... We see that, well, I've got that scripture there, Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the symbolic representation of the Holy Spirit was fire. And then when you see that fire is associated, that and then Paul says in, in another place to Timothy, if you want to understand how we can understand this quenching, that he tells Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God. 2 Timothy 1, through 5, uh, 1 5 through 7. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that once dwelled in your grandmother Lois and Homer the Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. So, once again, the idea of a fire, you know, you take your kindling, you get your lighter, you get everything lit up, and you get that little fire started, and you start blowing on it or fanning it, and you get some air to it, and get it to, to really burn it. And so he is saying, with regard to the spirit in your life, fan that into flame. In other words, do those things that draw you closer to Christ, that make you more like Christ, and place you in a position in which the spirit is using you in a greater way. So the contrary to that, when he says, do not quench the spirit, then that would be things in our life that, would prevent the Holy Spirit from using us. Oh, you say, am I limiting the Holy Spirit? No, absolutely not. But God will not honor us when we are disobedient. God will not honor us when we are rebellious. God will not honor us when we, when we have, have intentional sin and unrepentant sin in our lives. God will not use us in that way. He will not, as a holy God, will not deign to work with us. That's the point he's making. So don't do the things that will diminish the work of the Spirit in your life. And what is the work of the Spirit in your life? First of all, the Holy Spirit as a Christian will lead you into all truth. Jesus said that would happen. That's actually John 16 and 13. The Holy Spirit resides within you to help you to understand truth from error. 
to when you read the word of God or when you hear the word of God preached and then there's the lights go on on something or you see something. That is the Holy Spirit's work in your life. And that is vital in all of our lives. He brings us to maturity. He convicts us when we sin. You, you do something you shouldn't do and you feel that like conviction over that. That is the Holy Spirit telling you, no, you're not living in accordance with the Word of God. He empowers our witness. When we talked about speaking the Word of God or talk about preaching the Word of God, from the pulpit, or wherever the word of God is spoken, it is the Holy Spirit that makes that effective. It is not the preacher. It is not the preacher's gifts. It is not the preacher's ability to speak. There are always some better or lesser than others. But it is the Holy Spirit that takes his word and works it into heart to bring conviction for salvation also to bring us to a greater understanding of this truth. We've got to have the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So the question is, what does he mean by quench that? Do not do those things that diminish the work of God in your life. Matthew Henry said this, Christians are said to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He worketh as fire by enlightening, enlivening, and purifying the souls of men. We must be careful not to quench this holy fire. As fire is to be put out by withdrawing fuel. So we quench the spirit if we do not stir up our spirits. And all that is within us to comply with the motions of the good spirit. As fire is quenched by pouring water. So we must be careful not to quench the Holy Spirit by indulging carnal lusts and affections. Or minding only earthly things. So it's not just engaging in sin. It is actually taking our affections. And minding earthly things more than the things of God. And that's a continual battle of all of our lives. To mind the things of God. So if we, we can quench the, the Holy Spirit by willful sin. By willful disobedience. Things we know are wrong and we do it anyway. That will quench the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. He will not bless us to use us in that case. But we also quench the Holy Spirit. That's from the negative standpoint. When we refuse to do those things that amount to our growth in the Spirit. You see, Every command in the scripture has a negative and a positive. Even if it's just given as a negative, there is a positive implied in it. So yes, we are not to push the spirit, but yes, as Paul said to Timothy, we are to fan into flame that gift that is within us. We are to do those things that amount for our growth in Christ. One of those is gathering with the people of God. The worship of the Lord in a corporate manner has always been one of the primary means, if not the primary mean, for God working in the life of his people. So it's very important. Paul told Timothy to fan into flame of the Spirit. Now, one of the problems Timothy had was being timid. But he also had a problem, he may have struggled with some youthful lust. Paul said, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace among those who call on the Lord from your heart. So there is that which to flee from through which we can quench the spirit and then there's that which we just neglect to do that causes a quenching of the spirit. Because we are not obeying Christ. We are not seeking Christ. We are not following him. So Paul says do not quench the spirit. The second thing he talks about is honoring the proclamation of God's word. He says, do not despise prophecies. Now, what does Paul mean there? Well, prophecies in the Old Testament, the prophets did two things in the Old Testament. They did predict some. Most of what they did was preach. They were preachers. You come to the New Testament, you have the same thing. Now, there was in the early church, there was a class, there was a, an office of of the New Testament prophet. In fact, when you come to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, when Paul talks about that the church is built 
upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, the apostles are a ministry that we know is no longer active in the church. They were apostles. And the prophetic ministry of the prophets in the sense of those who were speaking God's word is a foundational ministry. It is no longer in operation in that sense. But there was another way that prophecy was used. Prophecy was preaching. Old Testament and New Testament, prophecy is preaching. It is the proclamation of God's word. It is the proclaiming of the truth of God to God's people. And God works with that through the Holy Spirit. Now, some people believe today that there is still an office. It's not a Baptist belief, but it is a charismatic belief. That there is still the office of prophet today. There are people still speaking God's word in the sense that a prophet does. We do not believe that. We believe that the prophetic ministry, just as the apostolic ministry, was a foundational ministry. Is God working in his church? Absolutely. Is he working in the exact same way he worked during the apostolic times? No. Now I want to say this. When people hear that, sometimes they get upset. They say, well, you're saying God's spirit is not at work. No, I'm not saying that at all. God's spirit is absolutely at work today. He's absolutely working all the time. But he is working differently. If you look in the, old, in the Bible, there were three periods. There were three periods of miraculous activity. There was the time of Moses and the Exodus. There was the time of Elijah and Elisha. And then there was the time of Christ and the early days of the New Testament church. Great times of miracles. The rest of the, of the, of the scriptural period was people serving God. So it is not any to say that these gifts are not active in the same way as they were in the early church. is not in any way diminishing or saying anything contrary to the scripture. It's actually upholding what the scripture said. So when we talk about, when he's talking about don't despise prophecies. The primary means we need to understand that today is to not be disdainful of the preaching of God's word. Not be looking down on that or not thinking that it's not a part of your life. Now we're blessed in this time that we have a lot of blessings that people in other days did not have. One of those is this. We have our own Bible. Why didn't people in other days have it? Well, first of all, most of them couldn't read Secondly, until the printing press, which was 1453, I believe, Bibles would, uh, to have a Bible would probably cost you about $3,000. You know, because they were meticulously handwritten. And that is the reason why you see in what's called liturgical churches that have a liturgy where they have readings from the scripture. It's a very old way of doing things because the people did not have their own Bible and they did, couldn't read anyway. So this was their opportunity to hear the word of God in the house of God. Now we're blessed in that we have our own Bibles. Most of us have a bunch of Bibles around the house. But let me say this, and, and you should be reading your Bible. You should be studying your Bible. You should take advantage of these blessings that God has given you. But the primary means by which God proclaims his truth to his church has not changed. It is by preaching. It is by proclamation. That is the primary means. It has always been that, and it always will be that. Yes, we have a lot of helps. You can buy helps and other variety of means that can enhance your understanding of God's word. And you need to take advantage of that. You need to take advantage of these blessings God has given you that other people didn't have. But you need to also understand that the primary means for God working in his church is through the proclaimed word. Not because it enhances the power of the preacher. Because he has chosen to work that way. As his word is proclaimed, his spirit works and honors his word. And so we need to understand that. So he says, do not despise, do not disdain, do not hold it in a lower thing. Well, I, I, I've heard people say, you know, I go out in, in the woods and I'm close to, I worship God that way. 
you know, or I do this, or I do that, and I worship God. I've got my, my other things that I do to study the Word of God. You need to be gathering with the people of God. And it's not just for the preaching. God works in His people through the gathered congregational city. That's the way it has always been since the beginning of the church. That's why the scripture tells us to do not neglect the gathering of yourself together as the manner of some is. You know, a lot of people neglecting the gathering together in the house of God. And there is a work that God does through this congregational gathering that he will not do in other ways. He can but this is the primary means by which God works. And part of that is preaching. Preaching. Now, preaching involves saying words. Now, there has been a statement you may have heard. It's nonsensical, but it does get out every now and then. It says, well, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. That makes no sense. Preaching is about speaking words. It is about proclaiming God's truth. God gave us his truth in words. Now, we're blessed that we have good translations. It, the New Testament was written in Greek. But we don't have to know Greek. We can read it in English. And it's a good, solid translation of what God said. But it is in words. And we are to hear God's words. And God works through that. So, what is the importance of the word of God? First of all, we're saved through the word of God. You hear the gospel. When you were saved, because you heard the gospel. Someone may have just witnessed to you and told you the gospel in that way. Or it may have come through a preaching or something like that. But you heard the gospel. And God saved you through that. The Bible says that we're sanctified by the truth. We're sanctified by the truth. The importance of preaching is that it is a means by which God sanctifies us. It is a means by which God brings us to a greater maturity. And we must be a part of that. We must listen. We must hear. And I would love it if you followed along. Because we're going to get in a minute and we'll show you. Paul's going to talk about testing things. So God places great stock in preaching. The world is convicted by the preaching. We need more preaching today, not less. We need more proclamation about Christ, not less. Part of the problem is today is that we have, we water it down sometimes. The world needs to hear. There's one God, there is one Savior, and that is Christ. And everybody's born and lost, and there's one hope, and that is in Jesus Christ. We need to, to make that very clear. I saw, this was, this was in a Baptist church, this was in Alabama, so you can always blame it on Alabama. But it was a high, um, it was an evangelism director uh, at the time, that was many years ago. He was talking as if the highest thing you could have in the service is you walk in, we didn't even have any preaching, people just meeting, went to the altar. That is nothing scriptural. Now, you hope people feel the power of God and will pray, you sure hope that, but you never diminish the preaching of the word. That's how God works. Historically, it's never been done that way. Now, what's happened, you've had a charismatic movement, and you've got charismatic stuff coming into the even Baptist churches, so there's a lot of things to be said there. And I know a lot about this, because I was raised Pentecostal. I was raised charismatic. So, understand that. But just understand that we are, have an obligation to hear and obey God's word as it is preached. It is important for me as a preacher to hear preaching. I go to a conference every year. Usually once a year I'll go to a conference. And basically we go to get preached to. And that's good. Because I need to hear preaching. Of course, Brother Mike can tell you that if someone who sits and prepares messages, God preaches to us as we're preparing. You know, because we get convicted over what we're about ready to preach y'all to y'all. And that's a work of God, too. But we all need to hear the word preached. That's the way God works. That's the way God works. But then there's a last thing. So well, you know, you're putting a whole lot of authority on the preacher. And you're saying it's a whole lot. Uh, we just need to listen to the preacher. Well, look what Paul said next. Test everything. 
And notice he tied it closely to do not despise prophecies. Because he said, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. In other words, what is being said, you don't need to just uncritically accept without testing it yourself. What is the standard by which you test it? The Word of God. That's why I love it when people have their Bibles open. I'm sure I'm doing it. And I do put the scriptures up there. Maybe I ought not to do that. They, they force people to open their Bibles. I don't know. But I want you to see the Word of God. I think that's very important. But you need to test what is being said. Do not uncritically listen. Because there are bad preachers out there. There are, you turn the TV on, you can hear anything. And you don't need to uncritically accept that. What does the Word of God say? Now, I am an expository preacher, which means I'm just going to go down through the passage and, and do that, which I think makes it a little easier to check me. Did I do that passage right? But you've got to be careful. And it is your responsibility as a believer to test all things. And that is done through the Holy Spirit. That is done by a work of the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you also, to be able to test things with regard to the preaching of the Word of God also requires a knowledge of the Word of God. When the Holy Spirit teaches us and leads us into all truth, He will take that truth that we know and lead us into the truth with it. With it. Well, well, here's something that says, that doesn't square with what I know the Word of God says. When you turn TV on, you probably see a lot of that. And you listen to it. So you need to know the Word of God for yourself. You need to study the Word of God for yourself. And have a knowledge, at least a working knowledge. And then the Holy Spirit will work in your life to say, something is not right here. I've been in messages where I said, I'm not right here. I went to me and Terrell, when Terrell and I were visiting... When we moved to Dallas and we were visiting churches, it took us about a couple of months to find a church. We went to a Mimmon, one church, and she's like, punches me and said, that's not what the passage says. I said, yeah, I know. And because uh, people don't always preach what's there. Sometimes it's just ignorance. Sometimes it's poor training. Sometimes it's a lack of, of effort, putting the effort in to study God's word. And let me tell you, preacher's going to stand before God for that. Preacher's going to stand before God for his responsibility. You better believe I am aware of my responsibility before God. It's not for my work and understanding it. Now, am I capable of making mistakes? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why you need to check me. That's why you need to read the Word of God. Uh, remember the Bereans. Where Paul, actually, when Paul left Thessalonica, if you look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, 16, Paul goes to Thessalonica and preaches, and they have a, a revival there, and then he gets run out of town. And because the Jews got stirred up, so he goes down the road about 100 miles to Berea, and he said, These Jews were more noble, for they searched the scripture daily. To see if these things were so. You hear what I preach. If you hear what anybody else preaches. You search the scriptures yourself. You have a responsibility. That is being. That is part of your personal responsibility. As a listener to God's word. You got a preacher that's not doing the right thing. God will take care of him. God will take care of him. You take care of yourself. You take care of your family. You take care of those. Over which you have the influence. That you test everything that is spoken in God's name. Woe be to the man who speaks in God's name and does not speak God's word. Woe be to that man. I don't want to be one of those. But test everything. He says, hold fast what is good. You test everything. You find that this is trustworthy. This is right. This is good. You hold fast to it. That's something I can bank on. Why? Because the preacher said it? No, because the word of God said it. Now, please understand this. There are men who have established faithfulness over the years. And you've known them to preach the word of God. And you've known them to be accurate in their preaching. I'm not saying... 
disbelieve everybody. There are men that I have grown to respect because they've been faithful over the years. When they say something, I'm really listening. Because they've had something to say and they do their work. Now, even that, you see somebody say, uh, I'm sure, sure about that one. Doesn't mean they're being a false prophet. It may mean that I'm not sure about that statement. But uh, that happens, and I've probably said them. I know I've said them myself. But hold fast to that which is good. But then it says, abstain from every form of evil. Everything that's not right, you abstain from it. You disdain it. You get away from it. Now that goes not only he's doing this in the context of preaching and proclamation of God's word, but it goes for everything else. You're out in your life and you're dealing with things and there's evil present. You've got to get away from it. Evil is like a cancer that just will get a hold of you and it will grow and grow. Sin uh, was a, a Southern Gospel song that said sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will make you stay longer than you wanted to stay. How you do that? You abstain from it. You abstain from the form, all forms of evil that you see. Very important. Once again, going back to personal responsibility. We have personal responsibility to, first of all, not to quench the spirit in our lives. To live in such a way that this God will be blessed to use us. He will use us rather than us being careless and disobedient and sinful in such a way that God will not bless us. But we are also to honor as a personal responsibility the proclamation of God's word. Understand the primacy that God puts upon the proclamation of his truth. You go back to even Moses. There's always been someone proclaiming God's truth. And there always will be. God has chosen that method and we are not to despise it. We are not to disregard it. We are not to think we've got our own way of doing it when God has chosen this way. But, having said that, we are to test all things. Everything you hear, you test it. You test it with God's word. You test it by your personal knowledge of God's Word, which means you better have some knowledge of God's Word. You better have some time in God's Word. I have a systematic, I'm not saying this to brag myself, I'm just saying that as a, how I do things, I have personal time that I am working through the Scriptures every day. I have some readings that I do that will take me through the Bible. And you can get them, they're all over the place, you can get them. But you need, I need that consistent intake of God's Word. Then when I finish that one, I'll shift over to another one. And basically it amounts to going through the Bible in a year. You, we need this consistent intake of God's Word. And I don't care how many times you've done it, and I've read through the Bible many times, I find God uses it in a different way in my life each time. I will say, I never saw it. I was visiting with Brother Fred uh, Brumfield uh, the other day. Well, it's been a couple weeks ago. We were talking. I was telling him about a passage. I said, you know, I never thought about this before. He said, how many times have you read that? I said, well, I don't know, a whole bunch. And he said, yeah, and then the Spirit did it in this way in your life. That's the way God works. But you need that input. You need that work in the, in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit can then take that. And then you're much more sensitive when somebody is preaching something wrong. You say, wait a minute, that's not the context of that passage. That's not what that was saying. You don't have to be a seminary graduate. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible. Just do those things that you know to do. And be responsible. See the things that are good, cling to it. See the evil, push it away. Your personal responsibility for your own spiritual life. The Bible speaks to that. And in these three commands, and they're all three commands that Paul gives, he speaks to that. May we take this seriously in our lives. Understand in your own personal walk, it's not just about getting your fire insurance to say, okay, I've taken care of my personal destiny, I'm good. No. 
This salvation walk is a lifelong walk. It is a walk in the Spirit and the work of the Spirit in our lives. He saves us by the power of the Spirit. He brings us to maturity by the power of the Spirit. He opens our hearts and our minds to truth by the power of the Spirit. Let's take responsibility in that in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. We just thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit's operation in our lives. Father, I pray that we each will be personally responsible in how we live in such a way that the Spirit will use us. May we never be neglectful of your word, but may we test all things, Father. We thank you that all these things are through your truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The hope of our lives. The hope that any of us have is found in Christ. There's going to be a judgment today. Those of us who are in Christ understand that. And he's bringing us to a greater maturity. But there are those who have not trusted in Christ. There are those who have not put their faith in Christ. For whatever reason. But you need to understand that there's going to be a day of judgment. And one of these days Christ will return. Maybe not in our lifetime. Maybe so. But one thing is certain is we're going to die. And when we die, we will face God. Is your hope in Christ today? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because that is the only hope you have for eternal life. You cannot do it on your own. You cannot do it through your business. Only through Christ. I would just urge you, if you do not know Christ today, to call upon Him. Put your faith in Him. We're going to be here. If you would like to pray, I'll be here. If you'd like to talk to me after the service, we'll be here. But just remember, death is certain. Christ is your only hope. May the Lord bless you. Please stand. Let's turn it on the 5-7.